painful and barbaric. That's how Russia's relentless attacks on Ukrainian civilian targets are being described. Several major cities are under siege, and more than one million refugees have now fled the country. Putin's war machine is being indirectly funded by the United States. Despite the sanctions, America is still buying oil from Russia. Dale Hurd reports on the latest from Ukraine and in the conflicting U.S. policies. Ukrainian officials are now reporting more than 2,000 casualties as Russia continues to shell major cities, including civilian areas. These aren't military targets. They are places where civilians work and families live. This is shameful. Representative Victoria Sparks has family and friends in Ukraine. This is barbaric and brutal to the level of unbelievable. They are bombing non-stop civilians, non-stop from morning till night. The International Criminal Court's prosecutor has announced an investigation into war crimes. The Russian army has reportedly taken the strategic port city of Kherson, the first large Ukrainian city to fall, and have four major Ukrainian cities surrounded. A massive Russian convoy 17 miles north of the capital, Kyiv, seems to have stalled. The war in Ukraine also continues to push oil prices higher, to $120 a barrel today, levels not seen since the Obama years. And it's hitting Americans squarely in the pocketbook. The last time I filled it up was about 110. I'm going to pay right now for 30 gallons, this 120 bucks, or oh, 150 bucks. It's $5 each gallon. Not only is our energy bill up, but our grocery bill is up. Our gas for our vehicles, that's up as well. In his State of the Union address, Joe Biden said he would release 30 million barrels from the strategic oil reserve to bring down prices. But critics call that a small band-aid on a misguided energy policy that has again made America dependent on foreign oil. You know, he's releasing uh, one and a half days oil supply for the United States. One and a half days. Well, that's not a strategy. And even as the U.S. uses economic sanctions to punish Russia for its invasion of Ukraine, it continues to indirectly fund the Russian war machine by continuing to buy Russian oil at much higher prices. The difference is more than paying for the war. So you can talk about all these sanctions, but all, all Putin has to do is look at the bank account, and every morning the U.S. is buying more Russian oil. Last year, the U.S. bought almost a quarter million barrels of Russian oil. At the current oil price, that's about $27 million into Russia's economy annually. In just 13 months, we've gone from a country that was exporting oil to one that now has to depend on our enemies for our energy. That's a very dangerous predicament. Economist Stephen Moore. We have 250 years worth of natural gas. We have 500 years worth of coal. We have 150 years worth of oil. We're not running out of it. We just need to drill for it. And that's not happening right now. And that is unfortunately playing into the hands of our enemies. Just last week, the White House put new restrictions on building liquefied natural gas terminals in the United States and put a moratorium on new energy leases on federal lands. And one of the first things Joe Biden did as president was to cancel the Keystone XL pipeline project. But it is a much more serious situation for the Ukrainian people. The U.N. says one million have fled Ukraine for neighboring nations since Russia invaded the country a week ago, setting off the fastest exodus of refugees in this century. Dale Hurd, CBN News. And this is a refugee crisis that Operation Blessing is responding to, and we're responding to it in your name. Our team will be on the ground on the border of Poland within hours, and we're going to be providing food and water and other essential items for the refugees. Uh, and we need your help to do even more. So if you'd like to be a part of it, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. You can write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. You can also text OB Crisis to 71777, or you can go online at CBN.com uh, and give a designated gift to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. Either way, do it now. Let's be a part of, of helping people 
in there. The need is absolutely tremendous. So let's be a part of helping. 1-800-700-7000. In other news, the potential economic impact of the war in Ukraine and how it affects the Federal Reserve's plan to fight inflation. Ephraim Graham has more on that from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim. Gordon Chairman Jerome Powell told Congress the Fed will stick with its plan of implementing a series of interest rate hikes to bring down high prices. It begins this month. I do think it will be appropriate to raise our target range for the federal funds rate at the March meeting in a couple of weeks, and I'm inclined to propose and support a 25 basis point rate hike. Powell warned the economic impact of war in Ukraine and global sanctions against Russia is, quote, highly uncertain, and it's too soon to predict how they could affect Fed policies, but the Fed will stay the course for now. Skyrocketing inflation has more Americans turning to dollar stores to buy the basics. The tough economic climate is forcing those businesses to change some policies in order to stay viable. Mark Martin takes a look at what that means for customers. When Aisha Williams made a trip to Dollar Tree, she was in for a surprise. I was a little shocked at first when I went in for the first time and it was like, oh my gosh, 25, I was expecting a dollar. So it was, I was really thrown off by it. The Virginia resident now plans to shop at Dollar Tree less often due to the increase to $1.25. Actually, I went into the store and bought something and it rang up as $1.25. I asked him about that. Lee Dean feels the increase makes sense in light of supply issues and the pandemic and also sees the flip side. I also feel like it's probably a lot for people who are relying on Dollar Tree and Dollar Stores for, um, you know, a lot of their food and whatever. I mean, it's 25 percent higher, so that could probably hurt a lot of people. Dollar Tree issued a statement about the increase, saying it was the right time to make the move in order to continue offering extreme value to customers. The company called the decision permanent and said it wasn't a reaction to temporary or short-term market conditions. CEO Michael Witensky added Dollar Tree pricing tests showed broad consumer acceptance of the price increase. It's not going to turn me away from coming in. Like I said, it depends on what you buy. Is stuff still a good deal? You just got to be a smart shopper. It's very sensible to do that. I mean, every every other industry has raised prices. You know, food services, automobile industry. It's, it's part of life in the United States. Still, industry tracker CoreSight Research found Dollar Tree experienced a meaningful decline in shoppers after the price increase during a check around the Christmas holidays. As for competitor Dollar General, the discount store says 20% of its merchandise goes for a dollar or less. Mark Martin, CBN News. Many people feel they're running out of options. Gordon? Well, what this does is it impacts the poor in the United States of America. You heard the president in his State of the Union address. He emphasized the need to have all recoveries be from the bottom up, but all of those plans will be destroyed by inflation. A 25% increase is a huge increase, and we're going to continue to see that. Just in the past week, uh, at, at my gas pump, gas has gone up a, a full quarter in just a week, and it looks like it's going to go even higher. Those costs for transportation is, is going to start getting baked into everything we buy. Uh, it's all based on trucking. It's all based on transportation. Those costs are all going to be passed on to you and me. And in that inflationary cycle, the federal government isn't going to be able to keep ahead of it. You can't pass the bills in time. You can't respond in a week or two weeks. So until these, until these prices get under control, and particularly energy prices get under control, we're going to continue to feel the pain and the pinch in our wallet. Rage has become the new normal. Whether it's fights on airplanes or outbursts at school board meetings, Americas are, Americans are angrier than ever. Some blame the pandemic, while others fault the deep political divide. Whatever the cause, the constant conflict is undermining our relationships, our communities, and even our democracy. Charlene Aaron brings us this look at what can be done to defuse the anger. It's official, our national mood has turned sour. 
with a recent poll showing more than half of Americans angry about the state of the country. After seeing it play out on the news or across the dinner table, many say it's time to end the rage and heal the wounds. From fights in the air to angry outbursts at school board meetings. My children will not come to school on Monday with a mask on. All right, that's not happening. And I will bring every single gun loaded and ready. Outrage has become the new normal. There's no end of provocations that are playing a part in this. On CBN's The Global Lane, Peter Wood, author of RAF, America Enraged, blamed pandemic restrictions and other issues for the rise in tempers. The uh, arrival of large numbers of people on our Mexican border, the backing up of ships off the West Coast and East Coast trying to deliver goods here, the unleashing of inflation into the mainstream economy. Each of these has brought the temper of mainstream Americans to a near boil. Stats tracking the conflict over mandating masks for airline passengers tell the story. The FAA reported almost 6,000 cases of unruly passengers last year a big jump from the 146 complaints filed by flight crews in 2019. Differing political views, often the driving force. According to Betsy Sinclair, a political science professor at Washington University in St. Louis, the problem has been building for some 30 years. If you ask people, you know, how angry are you feeling towards the opposite party? Or how frequently do you feel anger towards the opposite party? We're seeing Basically, 70% of Americans are reporting tremendous volumes of anger. In a research paper on the subject, Sinclair points directly at politicians from both parties and how they use mistrust and anger to their advantage. Candidates and campaigns have manipulated the emotion of anger to generate loyalty. So we often, you know, we quip that a, um, a loyal voter is an angry voter. But anger motivates people to take political action. It motivates people to, uh, it motivates people to vote. Sinclair adds that unrestrained anger can threaten democracy, which relies on healthy social interactions between people who disagree. What we find in our, in our research paper is really that it's, it's the case that anger is so harmful for the things like, what, well, will you water your neighbor's plants when they're on vacation? And that it hurts people. I mean, it hurts neighborhoods and it hurts families. As businesses face supply chain and staffing shortages, upset customers have been taking out their frustration on essential workers. Some restaurants are posting signs encouraging diners to be kind. John Cooper of the Christian rock band Skillet says while believers should stand up for biblical values, showing grace to those who disagree with our stance is vital. Grace has to be us Christians being willing to tell the truth, but not treating our enemies the same way that they treat us, recognizing that what we really want is for those people to come to know this amazing Lord that we know. In her book, the Habits of Unity, 12 Months to a Stronger America, One Citizen at a Time, Elaine Park provides key anger management tools. You can be in a space with someone whose views on a certain topic are entirely different from yours. You know, shift the conversation. Say, I respect your opinion. As an antidote, Sinclair suggests civic engagement. Her recently created app, Magnify Your Voice, encourages partisan neutral involvement in local communities. There's so many things that we can do that go beyond our partisanship to take care of our basic humanity. And I think that is what matters the most. People are going to disagree about their politics, but they're going to care about each other as a community. And we have to have both things. Meanwhile, Park believes spreading positivity can spark a unity revolution to help America heal. Unity is not going to trickle down. We need to bubble unity up from our own, from the humility of our own hearts and souls. And be humble when we look at the, in the eyes of another person, no matter what they think. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Those are words of wisdom. Be humble. Uh, don't think of others as somehow less than you just because they have a different opinion. That, those are remarkably wise words. 
Another thing I'll add to this is probably take a break from social media. Uh, and you're, we shouldn't expect uh, a trickle down that unity is somehow going to spring up in Washington, D.C. It seems like everything is, is geared to divide us even further uh, and to polarize us even more in hopes that a particular party will win the next election. Uh, and in that, uh, it's really advisable to take a break from it and say, OK, I'm going to shut down the phone. I'm going to shut down everything else. And I'm just going to spend some really good quality time with God. And when you do, you'll find the peace that passes all understanding. And then you'll be in a wonderful position to pass that around. Like he'd done something wrong. That's how Fred felt after a family member he trusted molested him. He hid the secret for years. He also shut down emotionally, took up a lifestyle of drinking and drugs. Fred lost everything, wound up sleeping in the woods, until he found the antidote to his shame in a Bible verse. We'd go out in the woods together, we'd play together, he'd read me books. We did a lot together. I loved him. Fred Weymouth was six when his parents opened their home to a troubled teenage relative, whom Fred looked up to like a big brother. My father tried to bring him in and give him some direction, some discipline, so he was around a lot. Then the molesting started, and what continued for years, Fred told no one. When those things were happening to me, it made me feel weird. It made me feel different. I didn't want people to look at me like I was weird. Especially his dad a caring, loving man he looked up to and admired. I did not want my dad to know because I wanted nothing more than my dad to say he was loved me and that he was proud of me. I wanted to please my father. I felt like I'd done something wrong. Finally, he told the boy to stop, and he did. Something, though, had changed. Something went off in me. And um, I, I closed down, I, I shut the world out. I was no longer this happy-go-lucky person that just, you know, just loved life, you know, it was gone. With the distance between himself and his dad growing, Fred found acceptance through his peers at school. He also discovered alcohol. The alcohol quickly became this, this crutch, if you will, for me. Um, that made me feel um, in, in control of my life. It, it helped me to feel um, good. And in his words, normal. By his senior year, Fred, known as the happy-go-lucky guy, had gone from drinking to smoking weed to heroin. It made me feel like nothing in the world mattered. You get so high that any, I don't care what it is, that you're going through is not there anymore. It's just completely gone. Meanwhile, Fred's relationship with his father had eroded. They fought often. One day at 17, after Fred missed another curfew the night before, they had words. Then it turned into a fight. When it ended a few minutes later, his dad told him to leave. I felt terrible about myself because I felt like I had laid my hands on my dad. And I, I had tried to hurt him like this. <sighs> Like this thing in me, man. All this stuff and all these things that had happened, it wasn't his fault. But I felt like in that moment, I took out my whole life on him. Fred got his own apartment, graduated high school, and actually started to mend his relationship with his father. He even started working for him at his insurance company. He also married his high school sweetheart and had a son, all the while battling his alcohol and heroin addiction. I wanted to feel Love, accepted, normal, and nothing in me felt normal. Finally, his dad convinced him to get into rehab and afterwards enlist in the Coast Guard. Although Fred left the drugs behind during his eight years of service, alcohol became his main addiction. After an honorable discharge in 2004, Fred went back to work for his father. Just four weeks after Fred came home, his father died from colon cancer. With his father gone, Fred turned right back to heroin. None of it was enough. The money wasn't enough. My family wasn't enough. My family's business wasn't enough. Nothing could fill that void in me. In just two years, 
Fred lost his wife, his children, his home, and even his father's business. He ended up sleeping in the woods behind a gas station. I was so angry. I'd lost it all. I was sleeping on cardboard boxes. Fred blamed his pain, his addictions, his losses, everything on God. And for the next 10 years, Fred spent every day, every moment, every dollar getting high or drunk. All that pain and that misery, I was numb to everything. And I would sit at night and fight over not wanting to use, but couldn't stop. During those 10 years, Fred would go into rehab several times, only to fail. I had gotten to this point that I had given up because I wanted to die. It wasn't until after his last rehab in 2014 that things changed. He was serving jail time for an assault charge when he heard a message in a chapel service that got his attention, that God could use even the bad things for good. That night, reading a borrowed Bible, he found the answer to his pain and a purpose. And when I read that he could use the foolish things, you know, the world can fail the wise and say, well, that's me, because I'm a fool. I'm weak. I, I don't know what I'm doing or how to do it, but God, you say you can use me, and I believe that. I know that I gave my life to Christ completely in that jail cell. I remember calling out to him and um, surrendering my everything to him. I felt those feelings. I felt the love. I felt like I belonged. It felt good. I felt like I had a chance. As Fred began living his life drug-free, he remarried, reconciled with his family, and before his abuser passed away, Fred extended loving forgiveness. God loves the whole world, and he wants you to cry out to him. The heart trouble is different for everyone, but he gives us an answer and a cure for that heart trouble, and it's Christ. Now, a co-pastor at the Fixed Ministry in Richmond, Virginia, he's still that happy-go-lucky guy only with a purpose helping addicted men find their healing in Christ. You can find the love that you're seeking in Christ and Him alone in the cross. I want people to be able to have a chance to that experience. God wants you to have that same experience. He wants you to have a chance. He wants you to have a hope. He wants you to have a future. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus is called a friend of sinners. That's why Jesus is my friend. He came to save sinners. The Apostle Paul said, this saying is worthy of all acceptance. He came to save sinners of whom I am chief. I found him. I found salvation. I found a living Jesus, not somebody in a book, not somebody 2,000 years ago, but somebody in the right here and the right now who said, I love you. I came for you. He knew everything I had done. He knew everything I was going to do. He knew it all. And he still loved me. He still forgave me. He still wanted me to be with him for all eternity. For Fred, he wanted him. He wanted him. Even when Fred was sleeping in the woods, even when Fred had no control over his compulsions, didn't want to use anymore and found himself using again and again and again. Jesus understands that. And he said it. You, 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 you look at what he said. Whoever sins becomes a slave to that sin. You become given to it. You have compulsions that drive you to it. The very thing you don't want to do, you end up doing this body of sin and death. Who can deliver us from it? Well, I thank God that Jesus can. He can come to you. What he did for Fred is an absolute miracle. Anyone who, tell, who, who has worked in any form of addiction will say, that's a miracle. You can be a miracle. Isn't that wonderful? You can be a miracle. All you have to do is say, Jesus, could you come? Could you change my heart? Could you take the foolish thing that I am, all the things that I've done wrong, could you take that foolishness and confound the wise? Could you, could you make me an example of your grace and your forgiveness and your love. If you do that and surrender everything to him, he'll come to you. 
He'll answer this prayer. All you have to do is ask. He says clearly, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. You can be in anyone. All you have to do is open the door. So let's do that. Bow your head with me. Pray a very simple prayer. Jesus will come to you. He will be your friend. He'll be your savior. He'll be your all in all. He's able to cleanse you, release you, change your innermost thoughts, change your very nature. He's able to do all of that. It's wonderful. All you have to do is ask. Let's pray. Jesus, say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you just as I am. You know the things that I've done wrong. You know the shameful things I've done. And Jesus, I ask that you forgive me. I don't want to be a slave to sin anymore. I want to live for you. So Jesus, come into my heart. Change my thoughts. Change my innermost being. Make me new again. And Jesus, if you do this, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask that you fill them to overflowing with your love and your acceptance. Cleanse them from all things that they've done wrong. Set them free from any compulsion now. And I ask it all in Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. The Bible says that when you believe in your heart, then you confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. We've made it easy. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us. 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I prayed with that guy on TV. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. Now, when you call, I've got something for you, for you, and I want you to have it. It's absolutely free. There's no financial obligation at all. It's called a new day. In there's a CD teaching. If you don't have a CD, that's all right. We, we can send you a download. Uh, it's a teaching on how do you live the Christian life? What do Christians believe? How do you know that your sins are forgiven? Uh, these are questions many new believers have. This will answer them for you and tell you uh, from Scripture what to do, what to do next, how to live the Christian life. It's all free. All you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The White House is unveiling a new strategy to fight the COVID pandemic. Goals include preventing and treating COVID by making testing and medications more available, avoiding shutdowns by providing tools for businesses and schools to improve ventilation and filtration systems. Much of the plan requires funding from Congress and could cost up to $30 billion. This year, Ash Wednesday became a day of prayer and fasting for the people of Ukraine. Christians around the world heeding Pope Francis's request. In the Philippines, they lit up the Manila Cathedral with Ukraine's national colors. The Tampa Bay community held a vigil at Epiphany of Our Lord Ukrainian Catholic Church. And Freedom Tower at Liberty University is a glowing reminder to students and the community to pray for peace. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. A few days after Sway was born, a neighbor told the family to give the baby away. That's because she was born with a cleft lip and palate, and her parents had no way to pay for the surgery their baby desperately needed. When Neri got pregnant, she went for prenatal care to a clinic near her home. There she learned something was not right with her baby girl. The doctor said my daughter has a cleft lip. When I heard that, I was shocked and cried a lot. I never thought something like that could happen. My husband and my son looked just fine, 
Why is she like that? My husband cried too. Three months after Srey Kuj was born, COVID hit their village and the government shut down travel. This is seven-year-old Mesa. A neighbor told my mom to give my sister away to other people. But I say no. I love her very much. I want my parents to take care of her and raise her well. When Operation Blessing learned about their baby, we arranged for Srey Kuj to receive free transportation and free surgery at a hospital in the capital city. I felt very happy after my daughter's surgery. Now she can drink the formula and everyone admires her. When she smiles, she looks so beautiful and she laughs a lot now too. I don't have to worry about her future. When mom bring my sister home, I saw her face is very beautiful. Then I was very happy. Thank you so much to the donors for fixing my sister's lips. She looks so beautiful. I don't know about you, but that story puts a smile on my face, and I hope it put a smile on yours. And a shout out to all of our CBN partners. Thank you so much for joining with us to change the lives of people and children like you just saw in that story. There are children and people all around the world who need simple surgeries to give them a brighter future. And when you join with CBN, you are literally changing the trajectory of somebody's life. You are giving them a hope and a future in the name of Jesus. And not only are you being the hands and feet of Christ when you partner with CBN, you're also spreading the gospel. A lot of times we wish we could go somewhere, especially during this pandemic. We wish we could travel and, and be a missionary to different countries, and sometimes we can't do that. But when you join with CBN, you are doing that because you're sending the message of the gospel to countries all over the world. You're spreading the message of the gospel in over 70 languages and in over 100 countries. So if you want to do that, partner with CBN today. It's really simple. All you have to do is give us a call at 1-800-700-7000. You can also go to cbn.com or you can always do my personal favorite. I always like to mention that. You can do text to give. All you have to do is text CBN to 71777. And there are different levels that you can join at. We have the 700 Club level, which is $20 a month. From there, you can go to 700 Club Gold, which is $40 a month. From there, you can go up. Whatever the Lord is putting on your heart right now, just be obedient to that because I believe the Lord is wanting you to be a blessing unto others. That's why he blesses us. He doesn't just do it just because he loves us, yes, but he wants us to give in return because he's a gracious father. We're created in, him, in his image, so we are called to be gracious and giving as well. So join with us today. All you have to do is give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. In just a couple days, 15-year-old Abel went from having trouble getting out of bed to making tackles in a big game. This high school wide receiver had a severe cold with difficulty breathing and aching chest. Then suddenly he received a crazy cure just in time for the big game. Here's how it happened. I remember I woke up and I just felt terrible. I felt horrible. It was spring of his freshman year in high school when 15-year-old Abel Caballero became ill. Even the night before, he wasn't feeling too great, but when he woke up in the morning, his throat bothered him. Culturally, we usually have a lot of home remedies. You know, we do the vinegar and <laughs> salt, and I had him gargle, and he went on to school. The next day, Abel woke up with more severe symptoms. I had an earache. My chest was hurting like I could not breathe. My nose was tapped. I couldn't really uh, breathe that well through my nose and I was just having trouble like getting out of bed. Clearly the home remedy didn't work. Now his throat and his ears were hurting as well. So at, at that point I was like, we need to go to the doctor. Still, he insisted on going to school. As a wide receiver and kicker on the varsity football team, there was no way he was missing practice during week one. He was determined he couldn't miss practice. And I was like, well, if you're ill, you can't go. But he's like, no, I'll be okay. Because he had no fever, Abby reluctantly permitted Abel to attend school. That morning, she settled down to watch one of her favorite TV programs, The 700 Club. Toward the end of the program, a prayer from Terry captured Abby's attention. You have a terrible sore throat. Um, it, it's so sore, it goes up into your ears, actually. And God is healing that for you. When I heard that, I jumped up, obviously, and I was like, uh, that's for Abel, you know, that's the first thing I said, and I just claimed it for him, and I prayed with them. 
And immediately after, you know, that segment was over, I text him uh, to see how he was feeling. And he texted me back saying, you know, about five minutes ago, which had been exactly, you know, when the segment was over, I started to feel relief in my throat and my ears. When Abel returned home from school, Abby showed him a recording of the word of knowledge she had claimed for him. They said that somebody had a sore throat and that their nose was clogged and that it was going to their ear and causing pain. And it was exactly what I was feeling. So I was like, that can't be a coincidence. This is kind of crazy. And it was, it was pretty cool. And I was actually starting to feel better. By the next morning, Abel's symptoms were completely gone and he went on to play in the big game. Even though they took a loss, he was grateful to be on the field with his teammates. He's especially thankful for God's healing touch. I definitely thought about how he loved me. That was exactly what I needed and at the right time because I had a game. So it, it definitely built my faith up because it just made me more confident in God. It made me know that prayer does work. Amen. Prayer does work. And I, I love what Abel said, that God knew exactly what he needed at the right time. And I just believe everyone right now, some people watching are, are going through some things and you're needing something specific right now. And just believe, me and Gordon are going to pray for you, but before that, just believe right now in your heart of hearts that the Lord will provide the answer. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is your great provider and you are the apple of his eye. So he will provide exactly what you need at the exact, exact right time that you need it. I pray and I hope that that story has encouraged your faith. And before we pray, we've got some more amazing answer to prayer miracle stories. So this is uh, Diane of Orlando. She wrote in, uh, who, she's 16. She started experiencing intense pain in her arm and shoulder. It got so bad, she could not continue doing her homework on her computer. Then one day she heard Gordon on the television say, someone is having pain in your arm. Put your hand where it hurts. By faith, Diane, the 16 year old, touched her arm and shoulder. After the prayer, the pain was completely gone. Diane said, what? And <laughs> praised God. That's so awesome. Amen. Right. Miracles. Here's another one. This is Abraham from Salem, Oregon. He suffers with migraine headaches and he's serving in jail. He's serving jail time. So the 700 Club is playing on the television in the jail, and so he listened in. He heard Ashley say, there's somebody watching. You are suffering from horrific migraine, of horrific migraine. You're suffering a lot of pain. It hurts to see, light hurts. The Lord is healing you now. Receive it right now. Just begin to praise the Lord. No symptoms from your migraine will be going away. Well, by faith, Abraham believed God for his healing his headache went away, his migraine went away. He gives all the glory to God. Just as Paul and Silas were visited in jail, Peter was visited in jail. You can be visited wherever you are. Isn't that wonderful? There's no time or distance. There's no problem for God showing up right where you are. You don't have to go up to heaven to get him. He's right there with you. Now, when two or more are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Now, we're gathered together. Ashley and I are gathered together. You're gathered with us. It's wonderful. It's all electronic. It's this wonderful miracle of media. But in the spirit, we're gathered together in his name. That means he's present. And when he's present, the Lord is present to heal. He wants to. He wants to heal you. He's not looking for a bargain. The bargain's already been made. What is he looking for? He's looking for faith. When Jesus saw their faith, he always congratulated their faith. Faith isn't something you drum up. Faith is something you look to Jesus. He's the author. He's the finisher. He's going to do a good job giving you faith. Don't think you have to drum it up by perfect acts or perfect prayers or fasting or anything like that. Look to him and realize it's already been done. And so that, that's a fact. These aren't things that you have to drum up. It's just, it's a fact. 
It's already happened. It's a fact. Look to that. Let that be the author and finisher of your faith. And then Jesus will come and he will do what he's promised to do. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. We come to you believing, believing in your power, believing in your sacrifice, believing the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one. Now stretch forth your hand to do miracles, signs, and wonders. Recreate things, Lord God. Take away all cancers, all pain, all nerve damage, all brain damage. Take it all away now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. There's someone, you've got a severe injury to your uh, right shoulder, and it was unfortunately caused by um, an injury related to you being arrested, uh, that it was... I don't know if it was right before, but being put in handcuffs really caused you damage. God is able to heal, and he's coming to you right now. Just forgive the trauma, forgive the injury, forgive anyone responsible. Just set them free from it, and God is going to set you free from that pain right now. It just left you. Do what you couldn't do before. Raise that right arm. Raise it all the way up to heaven and receive the blessing, the miracle that is coming to you right now in Jesus' name. Ashley? Yeah, I believe someone's watching. You have a severe blood condition. I I believe it's hemophilia, and you suffer a lot because of this. There are certain things that you can't do. You're on certain medications that have different annoying and hard side effects. You've You've prayed. You've cried out to the Lord. God is answering your prayer right now in Jesus' name. Just receive this miraculous healing. Just let the Holy Spirit flow over you right now. Just receive it. Begin to praise the Lord. We just rebuke fear and doubt in Jesus' name. And this blood condition shall not and will not return. It does not belong to you in Jesus' name. Well, there's someone, you, you play the piano and you're having difficulty playing because your right hand has numbness and tingling particularly in the, the, the fingertips, uh, the first, first three fingers of, of your right hand. God is healing that nerve, and he's restoring mobility. He's restoring feeling and touch. What you couldn't do before, do now. Begin to move those fingers, remove, move those hands. All that numbness, tingling, all of that loss of sensation, leaving you now, I believe he's fixing a vertebra, um, uh, the cushion between the the vertebra, he's fixing that so the nerve is no longer pinched. He's literally stretching out your spine right now. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. I also believe people are watching with horrible arthritis in their hands, stiffness, you can't open things, it's very painful. Just receive the healing of the Lord right now. Believe it. Receive it for yourself in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you've had a crush injury to your right elbow. Uh, I don't know what it is with right arms with me today. But anyway, your right elbow, you've had a crush injury, and, and God is able to take even all those little tiny chips out of that joint and give you full mobility and full function. In Jesus' name, be healed. Someone else, you've got constriction related to a um, third-degree burn and God is able to heal that, give you movement, give you uh, full, full access uh, and, and full mobility now in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you work miracles. We thank you that you left heaven to come to us. We thank you that you love us so much that you died for us. Be with us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we're here for you. Uh, All you have to do is pick up the phone and call. We want to pray for you 24-7. So if you need prayer, give us a call.
Well, we've got yes. a little bit of time for some email questions. Just a little bit. All and right. I know this one is on your heart. Yes, it is. All right, so this is Karen. She's asking, is it possible for our loved ones who have passed away to come to us in dreams or when we are awake for us to sense that they are next to us? Is it real? Are they watching over us from heaven? It brings me a lot of comfort to believe it. I think a lot of people have this question. Well, Karen, be, be comforted, uh, but the Bible is quite specific. Don't look for it. Um, you know, did, did uh, Samuel appear to Saul? Uh, yes, he did. Uh, so is it possible? And you're asking that, yes, it is. Uh, but we're not supposed to consult with the dead uh, or pray to the dead or, or look for answers from the dead uh, because that uh, is opening yourself up to what's called familiar spirits who will actually lie to you. Uh, when Samuel came to to Saul, he said, why are you asking me? If you can't get an answer from God, don't expect to get one from me. Mm -hmm. All that said, there's a wonderful example from Ashley's own life. Uh, just a few yeah. years ago when she was at the age of seven. I, I, yes, <laughs> I had a dream and uh, my cousin who unfortunately passed away at the age of 11, um, it was a very traumatic and a shock to our family. She came to me and, well, sh she was in my dream and it brought a lot of comfort to my family. I shared with my mother who then shared with her mother, which is my aunt. But there was a message. In. There was, she said something to me and I don't really know what she was saying. It was just like, it was reassuring. Yeah. It was like Everything's her, okay. everything is okay. She, I was, she was there with me in the bed that I was sleeping in. She was in white. And it was just comforting. It was like, oh, hey, Megan, how are you? You know, good to see you. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it, you know, then I, I think I shared at the funeral. And so, yeah, I actually was curious about that question myself. So, yeah. And it's amazing to me that God would use you at age seven to bring that message of comfort to your family, that you were specifically chosen to be that messenger of mm -hmm. comfort um, that definitely marks you for your whole life that you're a messenger of comfort. Anyway, I think we're out of time because they're playing the music, so we could talk about this a long time. There's a whole lot to this, yeah. uh, but uh, let that story encourage you. Here's a word from Luke chapter 5. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. For Ashley, for me, for all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.